So let's explore the different transaction types that we have in the Arden blockchain. A lot of inspiration for these transaction types came out of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I didn't really dig into the Bitcoin source code. Uh, I think all that's written in C. I did dig into the Ethereum source code written in Go. But in reading a lot of articles, some of the semantics from Bitcoin um, are, are introduced. And you'll see this stuff sort of labeled when we look at it. The Arden blockchain is going to have essentially just three transaction types. But if you look at Ethereum, um, it's interesting because they have a lot of different transaction types. Also, transaction types that had to change over time because the protocol changed. So they have a lot of complexity in being able to handle those sort of, um, say, different versions of a transaction and, and really different types. Like your basic money transaction is different than, say, a transaction that deploys a smart contract. So again, they have a lot more complexity there, but you'll be able to start extrapolating the complexity that you would need to build something like Ethereum as opposed to sort of our reference implementation. And, and that's really what I want you to get to. You'll start to be able to kind of connect dots. Oh my God, if I wanted to have a smart contract EVM system, I would need to do, yep, you got it. You're, you're, you're in line now. So let's take a look at our sort of transaction types here. And to do that, I'm going to go under our blockchain and I'm going to add the new database package. And you can see here that we've got um, a bunch of different files here. Transaction, database.go. Let me at least add this for now. I like to have that first file, new file. Database.go. Just add that. And then I'm going to add the transaction.go file. There it is. And we're going to kind of start here with the different transaction types that we're going to have in the Arden blockchain. So I'm going to start with this one right here. And let me, let me hide that so we see more screen here. Notice that I've got the word Ethereum labeled all over this because, again, this transaction type has really been um, kind of modeled after, inspired by the Ethereum system. So anytime we want to send, again, we just focus on money. We're not doing anything more than allowing somebody to move money. Think of us almost I, just as a bank at this point, right? There's no extra feature functionality here. A lot of that extra feature functionality you get on Ethereum isn't necessarily coded in Ethereum directly. It's all done through smart contracts. Um, and it's coded by people like, like your NFT protocols and things like that. They're really part of a smart contract um, protocol where Ethereum is, is the base mechanics for validating and making sure everything is, is, is clean, right? So here's our transaction type. The chain ID is critically important. So we can make sure this transaction is for this particular node um, and for this particular blockchain. So all the transactions will have a matching chain ID for this uh, particular blockchain. And we're also going to, by putting it in the transaction, we can also catch mistakes. Somebody sends a transaction to the wrong chain because they've got to switch something in their wallet. The nonce is super, super important. Um, let's just briefly talk about the nonce. The word nonce stands for um, only once. It's a value that you're only allowed to use one time in the context of where it's being used. In our case, the nonce is going to represent the transaction number. And we're going to need to, remember I told you in the accounting database, um, we're going to store the balance and there's other things. Another thing we're going to need to store in the accounts is the last nonce that was used. So we don't want transactions being executed out of order. You might, as a client, send three transactions one after the other, and you don't want them executed in any order other than the order that you want. So the nonce will start out at, at basically one for the first transaction, and then the next transaction it needs to be two, and then it needs to be three. And if we see transaction five, and we know we're supposed to get four, we're not going to process five until four comes in. And essentially now you're stalled executing anything until that transaction four comes in. And if we see transaction two come back, 
right? Nonce2, we're going to throw that away because we don't want to execute the, say, the same transaction twice. So this nonce is critical for making sure we only execute any given transaction once and that we execute things in the order. Now, if you've ever played on Ethereum or, say, Bitcoin, your wallets are already doing this. They're asking the blockchain, what is the next nonce I should use? And then they're applying that. So it's something that you probably have never had to deal with. But if you go look on Etherscan, um, say for your address, if you have one, you can see the, the nonce values and the details. And you'll s basically, the nonce would tell you for any given account how many transactions they've ever sent. All right? And so it's going to be a unique ID. But really, that ID is more than that. It's, it's going to be a number that represents that transaction so we can execute things in order and not double spend. OK, from and to, that's going to be the addresses. Now, you can see here that I've got a special type called account ID. I did that in this case um, just to be really clear in the code, even though an account ID is a string. I wanted two things. One. I wanted to be clear that we're storing account IDs. And two, I wanted to validate account IDs against our protocol. So if I add the account.go file, a couple things here that I want to stress about this. You do not want to, you do not want to define an alias for the sake of it. If I saw this in code and that's all I saw, I would tell you to use string. Because that's all an account ID is, is a string. And so when you look at it like this, it's very, conf like, this isn't telling you enough, especially if it's just a string and always a string. I'd rather that say string, all right? The, uh, it, I'm telling you, right, this idea of just aliasing for readability doesn't work. Don't do that. Now, why am I doing it if I'm telling you don't do something like this? I'd rather this be string. Because there is a protocol to what an account ID needs to be, right? It needs to be a hexadecimal number. has to be of a certain length. And so what's kind of cool is by defining this type, then what we can do is define a set of functions or method set to validate that an account ID is more than just a string. And so here's a function called two, right? Given a hex string, um, we convert it into an account ID. That's just a, a conversion. But you can see here that I can now have a method set that is able to validate that the address has a length of 20 and is a hex. Now, the rest of this code down here I stole from the Ethereum code base. Because why should I write that myself when it's already been done? <laughs> and so here's exact code that even Ethereum uses to validate an address is, is a proper address part of our protocol for what addresses are. So this is why, in this case, you'd want to have your own type. Not to alias, because we want to write behavior behind it uh, to validate some things. If it's just an alias, I'm going to tell you not to do it. This, to me, is like a factory function. This is like new, but it's conversion, right? So based on hex string, converted to an account ID. And we can validate that it's hex, starts with 0x, and then it's, it's 20 bytes in length. Beautiful. OK, so we've got this type, not just an alias, but a type with behavior. And now we know that when we're talking about a an account ID, we're talking about a 20-byte hexadecimal value. Nice, nice. OK. The value is the amount of money that we want to send to the, um, from the two. That's the amount. Tip is the amount of money we're willing to offer a node for processing this transaction right away. We'll talk about more of that stuff later. And then any extra data that you want to add to the transaction, you can do that. Now, in a system like Ethereum, Adding data is going to cost you more money, more money in fees uh, and things like that, because that data has to be stored. Smart contracts, essentially, their, their opcodes get stored in a data field like that. So um, we're not going to charge any extra fees here on the Arden blockchain. 
But imagine that since that has to be stored on disk and that costs time and money, um, somebody that's storing data is going to have to pay extra for that on a system like Ethereum. So this is our transaction type. There it is right there. And um, this is all the information we need to be able to process moving money from one person to the next and make sure we don't get into any, any real problems. I don't like this comment anymore, right? Like this comment, unique ID for the transaction. I'm going to change that later because it really represents uh, um, a unique transaction number that has to be in order, um, literally in order to make sure that everything is clean in this particular case. I'm going to fix some of that um, off, off camera. OK, now again, this is your transaction data, but data has to be signed for it to be viable and used you know, over the wire across to the node. So the next transaction type that we're going to see, well, let's, let's, add the, let's add our factory function. Not a bad idea. Always remember, you want to do type, factory functions, um, and then um, any method set. Now, I also want to bring up this. This is a factory function. I want you to notice that we're using value semantics, value semantics here, not pointer as a general, a real general rule. If the type represents pure data, like TX does, I'm going to use value semantics. That data is safe to be copied around, and mutations are isolated to that copy. If the type, like a struct type, represents an API, I'm going to use pointer semantics. Um, because really, that API isn't something that should be copied. The state of the API should be shared across those process boundaries. So as a general rule, I'll ask, does this type represent pure data, or does it represent an API? And I'll kind of start there with my choice of semantics. And this absolutely represents pure data. We can see here that on the constructor, we can validate again using our method set for that account type uh, whether these IDs um, are, match the protocol. Then we construct that transaction, and we can return it. So, Again, don't do this just to create an alias. If I see this and I don't see a method set behind it, I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to tell you, just use the string. You're not getting any compiler protections anyway, because a, a, a literal, um, a, so let's try this again, a constant of type string right, can be implicitly converted to an account ID. We're kind of seeing it here. Look. That's just an implicit conversion, really, at the end of the day. I'm, no, I mean, it's explicit here. But that can happen implicitly, is what I'm trying to say. So you don't get any compiler protections from it. So if you're going to do this, I want to see some behavior. OK. Got our there. Now, before we write that, let's look at the next transaction type. That's the signed transaction. Notice I'm embedding TX. So a signed transaction is everything a TX is plus the signature in the RSV form. I could have done that with a slice of bytes. And maybe that would have been more efficient. But for some reason, inside the Ethereum code base, this is how they do it. They, they store the signature in this VRS format. So I decided to follow closer to the Ethereum sort of data structures than my own. I do have some projects where I play with digital signatures where I send the slice. But again, I'm, I'm trying to build a reference implementation here. You can see here that we've got the, the recovery, the first coordinate, second. We've talked about that. But this is what needs to be sent over the wire, the signed transaction. You just send me a transaction without a signature. I can't do anything with it. So. What we need to do now is be able to produce one of these signed transactions. Remember, we already have the code that we wrote in the last section to generate signatures. So what we can do is build a method now off of our transaction type. Look at that. And so if I add this method called sign, given a private key, we can now use our signature sign function, get the signature back, produce a signed transaction, and send that back to the caller. This is really nice, right? So you construct a TX, and then you sign it, and then you get a signed TX that we can, at that point, send over the wire. Now, we're going to want to validate a signed transaction, right? We're going to want to validate that. So, so look at our method here for validation. And you can see it's a pretty long 
sort of method here, a pretty long method. Let's walk through all the validation that we're going to be able to do. And we can do this on the node, right? So the first thing we do is when we call validate, we want to know what the chain ID is supposed to be for uh, the transaction. I'm not going to hard code that, right? We might have different instances running different chain IDs. So the first thing we do is we validate that the chain ID is correct. Then we're going to validate that the from and the to um, addresses are of the proper form. And then we're going to validate that somebody's not trying to execute a transaction where they're going to send money to themselves here, just so we don't have to waste any CPU cycles and, and do any of that. Then we're going to do a basic signature verification. Again, it just validates the form of the signature, right? Nothing more, nothing less. That's all we can do here. And then we're going to extract the from address from the data and the signature. We saw us in the last section we did this. And then we're just going to make sure that that address matches the from. And that's our sanity check to know that the sender who signed this is the same person in the from. It, and, and it gives us that extra check that we can trust this transaction. We can trust the signature um, because they match. Pretty good, right? So everything that we talked about before kind of comes into life now here. Now, again, yeah, this is validate. And we'll be able to use this in, in a couple different places. OK. So we've got our signed. We've got our validate. Um, and then I've got these two, we'll call them helper functions here, helper functions that essentially let us take the signature and convert it into a string for display. Um, and then I'm implementing the stringer interface that both the FUMP and the logging package implement. So when we're going to be logging a signed transaction, we could have this unique understanding of its from and its nonce, right? And that's going to help in the logs. Now, you can see here we don't have this signature string function in our signature package. Again, we're only bringing in the things that we need at the time we need it. So here it is, signature string. It's an exported function there. So let's bring that in. Uh, I think we put it right here. I put it right above the two. There it is. Oh, not even. I don't even have this one yet. So two signature bytes, two signature bytes of Arden. We have the two signature bytes. It doesn't really matter. I don't have an exact spot. All right. Now it does need the two signature bytes with Arden. Let's bring that in. Let's just double check this code that we have here. So we have the two signature bytes that converted um, RVS to a slice of bytes, removing the Arden ID. We needed that for one of the calls. This, again, is for presentational purposes. Um, and you can see here that we're going to encode the string. But this is going to keep the Arden ID in there. So on display, I want to see the, the 29 or 30, as opposed to when we need to execute something against an algorithm. Um, we, don't wanna, we don't want that. So, um, so we've got that there. Very cool. Oops. I don't know what I just did. Oh, there we go. OK. So we go back to our transactions here. We now have the ability to pretty print um, using the stringer interface. And anytime I need that string, uh, we're, we're going to get that back in its, in its kind of proper form to kind of look at. OK. Let's go back to our transaction types. And then we've basically got one sort of transaction type left, but I'm, I'm going to skip that block transaction for now. I'm going to skip it um, because we don't really need that until we're ready to batch a bunch of transactions and, and sort of serialize them to disk. So let's just we'll put that on the side for now. We'll get back to that when we need it. We do at least at this point have the two transaction types. I mean, we have the TX itself. That's the data. That's the transaction information. And then the signed TX. And we have the ability to sign that TX to a signed. And then we have the ability to validate a signed transaction based on everything that we've learned up to, up to this point. And so for now, those are the transaction types uh, that we have to deal with. The next thing now we can kind of think about more is the, the accounting database and what kind of information we need to properly store there.